introduce today's guest speaker, Mark Chen. So Tara Lee, thank you. All right, and guys, can I ask, we don't usually make you squish up, but can I ask you guys to come over here today because we keep having trouble with this screen. I don't want any excuses about getting bad grades on the quizzes. So if you can just squish over to this one side for today, um, that will be easier on us because this is the one that wants to work today. So, all right, while you're moving, I know it's a little noisy, but um, it's my privilege to introduce to you today one of my valued friends, Mark Chen. Um, Mark has a distinguished career which began at Altiris, where he participated in its 2002 IPO. Um, I know you guys are moving, but who, kn who knows what IPO is? Anybody, Harry, maybe? Initial public offering. Okay, so that is, a weighty benchmark of business success um, where they start offering stock to the public. And so that's a, a term you guys might want to be familiar with if you're going to continue in business. Um, and eventually that $1 billion acquisition of Altiris by Symantec. Um, Mark spent time working in finance with the Wall Street firm, firm Morgan Stanley and then in 2009 joined Compliance 11. Most recently, Mark was the co-founder and CEO of SaltStack, which is a leading provider of digital infrastructure automation and cloud management solutions. SaltStack products and services are sold commercially and used globally by many of the world's largest corporations, including LinkedIn, Intuit, TD Bank, Tyson Foods, Under Armour, NASA, JPL, and Adobe. In October 2020, Mark led SaltStack through a successful acquisition by VMware. While leading SaltStack, Mark was recognized as a top entrepreneur in the state of Utah and named a Peak 100 winner. Mark currently serves on the board of Silicon Slopes and is passionate about sharing his journey as an entrepreneur and advising other entrepreneurs and startups as a board member or advisor, which is why we are lucky to have him here today. Um, Mark holds an MBA in finance and an undergraduate degree from Brigham Young University where he was an all-American high jumper. Um, Mark and his beautiful, talented, patient wife, Teresa, are the parents of three energetic young adults, ages 19, 18, and 15. So I'll turn the time over to Mark. How's the mic working? Yeah? All right, it's on. Okay, I'm gonna stand out in front of the podium here just because I wanna interact a little bit more with you guys. Appreciate you oh. uh, inviting me here to campus. It's great to see Russ. Russ and I were uh, colleagues at the uh, BYU MBA program. And of course, I knew Tara Lee and her family back in Manhattan when we lived in New York City. It's good to see Harry here. Uh, someone that I have known for many years now. Um, before we get started, I want to just ask a few questions so that I can get to know you better and so that I could tailor my remarks. Um, how many of you are freshmen in college? Okay, so a good, good number of you. How many are sophomores? Any juniors? Seniors? Other? Other categories? <laughs> Super seniors? Super seniors? Um, and how many of you think that at some point in your life or your career that you would like to start a business? Okay, pretty good number. Okay, excellent. How many of you think that after taking this class that you're absolutely convinced that that's not for you? Okay, it's good to have an open mind, so great. Um, I think this kind of a course this kind of a forum is an excellent forum for those who are exploring, who want to learn more about the world of business, who want to understand what it takes to kind of create and establish businesses of any kind. You see that um, that small business segment in our economy is uh, one of the largest and fastest growing, and it's really what fuels uh, our economy here in the United States. And so I think that you know entrepreneurship is the lifeblood of, of, uh, uh, of our economy and of our nation, and so it's really exciting uh, to participate in that process at some point in your career. So I decided to tailor my remarks today and to talk about something that I call the entrepreneur's journey. And um, what I hope to do, rather than just kind of talk at you about a bunch of theories and hypotheticals, is to share a few personal experiences. I'm gonna first actually start off as any good um, executive would share. I've got a little agenda here, so we're gonna start off by talking about my background and I'll help hopefully you guys understand where I'm coming from, uh, what my background is, and why I've done what I've done. 
And then we'll move on from that to uh, the SaltStack experience, right? Uh, SaltStack is the company that Tara just referenced. That was the first opportunity that I had to take a company from the very beginning, uh, a literal basement, to uh, fundraising, growth, hiring, uh, our first customers, and then eventually an acquisition. And I'll talk about that, that journey as well. And then the third uh, portion of, of my remarks will be reserved for some personal stories, right? We'll call these the outtakes of entrepreneurship, right? We'll talk a little bit about some of the, the good, bad, and the ugly. Call it riding the lion, one of our biggest disappointments, and then making payroll, right? These will be some fun, maybe hair-raising stories for us to relive together. Um, and then at the end, we'll leave a few minutes for question and answer. Sound good? Okay, cool. And if any of you guys have questions along the way, I'm entirely open to having you ask me questions. Raise your hand, would love to, would love to jump in. All right, so maybe to get started, you know, I think it's really important for us to think about where we come from, right? Everybody starts at a different place in life. Everybody has a different background that helps them to, uh, that, shapes their, uh, ref that shapes their frame of mind and how they think about the world. Um, I put this picture up because in 1949, these, this is a picture actually of my grandparents, William and Helen Chen. They were living in mainland China. I'm half Chinese. Uh, in 1949, before the Communist Party took over, uh, they were two young college students. And they were living there. Um, you know, they had dreams of their own. And when Mao's armies threatened to take over Shanghai, which is where they were living, they made a decision that they didn't want to be a part of the Communist Party, and so they fled uh, from mainland China, and they uh, hopped on a boat and ended up in Taiwan. So Taiwan is kind of where the journey for my family as I know it begins. Uh, so the Chens go from Shanghai to Taiwan, and my father was born there, he had four siblings, and then in 1963, the family made a decision that because they wanted to pursue the, you know, their own set of opportunities, they wanted to make a move to the United States. And so they immigrated to Palo Alto, California. Palo Alto is a hotbed of startup activity and there are a lot of startups, people creating businesses there. Um, Silicon Valley is kind of, uh, you know, the, the moniker or acronym or the, uh, the nickname that it's been given over the years. And uh, they, they did start over. They started over with a Chinese restaurant and a photo lab, right? So they kind of went back to their roots and they created two businesses that uh, allowed them to provide for their family and then off they went. Um, I, was, uh, uh, I was born in Washington State. I wasn't born in Seattle. I was actually born in Eastern Washington in a town called Spokane. Um, and I lived in Spokane until I was 13 and then I moved to Seattle. Um, Seattle was a great place. Uh, my father was a businessman as well. He was a chief financial officer for different companies. When we moved to Seattle, he worked for a ski company called K2. Have you guys heard of K2 before? Anybody, ski, anybody own K2 skis? Okay. Um, and then in 1991, he announced to our family that we were gonna make a move. Oh, and when I was a kid, I was a huge basketball fan and that's why I kind of threw in a little Seattle Supersonics reference. Anybody know who the Sonics were? Anybody heard of the Sonics? Okay. All right, so in 1991, I made the move with my family to Hong Kong. And Hong Kong at that point in time, Hong Kong is known as one of the hotbeds of capitalism and free markets, right? It has been historically. Um, it is just this bustling economy of free trade. And uh, we moved there in 1991, and my father uh, took a position with a company. It was a joint venture. A joint, do you know what a joint venture is? Joint ventures are, you know, two companies come together to create a synergistic business. And in this case, it was McDonald's and a company called Continental Grain. They were combining their resources together because they wanted to uh, manufacture McNuggets for all of Southeast Asia in China, as opposed to making them in the United States and going through that entirely expensive process of then making them, manufacturing them, freezing them, shipping them, and then distributing those to all of the different McDonald's franchises in Southeast Asia. So my father, as the chief financial officer, uh, raised you know, $40 million for this factory that they built, and that, out, that was where they began to establish uh, manufacturing for all the meat products, not just McNuggets, but for all the meat products in Southeast Asia. They slaughtered half a million chickens a day in that factory, which is kind of a crazy thing. 
Anyway, so Hong Kong was a great experience for me. I uh, met all sorts of amazing people who were doing interesting things in business and in government, uh, in free trade there, um, and uh, really loved that experience. And then uh, as an 18-year-old, I graduated from high school and uh, found my way uh, you know, in Provo, Utah, going to school at BYU. Uh, I walked onto the track team, as Tara Lee uh, mentioned in her, in her uh, introduction, uh, and I was a high jumper, right? And I was um, just a walk-on, a lowly walk-on. Um, anybody here involved in athletics at Snow? Okay, we've got a few hands, okay? Awesome. So uh, I discovered, and I think that it's a lot of fun to discover what your talents and gifts are in life. Uh, if you don't know what they are, everybody has something that makes them distinctive and unique, right? Something that's special and good about each and every one of us. And I believe that when we can discover those things, uh, and if we can find ways to weave them into our life story, um, you know, it yields a lot of happiness and joy. And for me, as an 18-year-old, high jumping was really kind of one of those things. And so I walked onto the track team and, um, you know, eventually was able to kind of really turn that into a great opportunity. Uh, in my life. Uh, at BYU, I met my wife, Teresa. As Tara mentioned, she is extremely patient. Uh, the, the journey of an entrepreneur is not an easy road uh, by any stretch. Nine and a half years of building a company, and we'll, we'll share those outtakes with you. I have three kids. Oldest is 19. She's serving an LDS mission in Argentina. A daughter that's a senior who's graduating from Lone Peak High School up north in Highland, Utah, and a son that's 15. And they really are, when I think about uh, the core of why I do things and what's important to me, you know, they're really at the epicenter of, 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 um, uh, of everything that uh, is good and meaningful in life for me. So when I think about um, uh, the professional journey that I've been on, I graduated from BYU. Uh, I was, um, you know, really dedicated to athletics. Um, I was fairly dedicated to my studies, uh, and I had a lot of ambition though, right? I had a lot of ambition to be successful, to drive forward, and to find something that I could be the best at in the world. And when I graduated from BYU, um, I, uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about like, what was I gonna do? And that was a really pressure-filled conversation. How many of you feel like you know exactly what you wanna do when you graduate with your degree by raise of hand? Okay, like there are no hands that went up. So I think that this is really one of the life questions that, that everyone is trying to figure out and trying to answer for themselves is like, what, is my, what am I gonna make of my life? What am I gonna become? And how am I gonna get there? Uh, these, are, these are perplexing questions at times, right? You're thinking about how do I actually combine my, my, my life experience with things that I'm interested in and the ambition that I have to turn that into something that's gonna be meaningful and good, right? Um, and when I graduated, I actually started my career working for a company. Have any of you guys eaten Cheerios before? <laughs> or Yoplait yogurt, right? So my actual first job out of school was with, it was selling um, uh, consumer food products for a company called General Mills, right? They're the manufacturer of all of those uh, products there. They're a huge, you know, marketing, company, you know, a huge brand company. And uh, so I worked with them because they were willing to give me an opportunity to continue jumping professionally. I was trying to make the Olympics in 2000. And uh, they were one of the companies that would allow me to work full time for them and train. And so I moved to the Olympic Training Center and I did that. And it was a really great place for me to start. Learned a lot. But I realized pretty quickly that that wasn't the area where I wanted to really spend the rest of my life. High jumping has a pretty short shelf life as well. And so when I was done high jumping, um, I started to think about what industries would I be, could I be really excited about. And so I jumped into the world of software. I w jumped into the world of technology uh, with a company called Altiris. Um, and the slide was a little bit disordered, but you can see here on this particular slide that Altiris, it was a software company. It was based in Linden, Utah. And in 2000, this is right on the heels of when companies were, um, you know, it was kind of the dot-com bubble had burst, right? 2000, everything had just kind of fallen apart. Not a lot of companies were really growing in the tech space, but Altiris was one of those companies 
that focused on a problem and a solution that actually was still in great demand at that point in time. And so I was able to join them and to participate in an experience where we grew and then eventually we were able to kind of have great success after we acquired tens of thousands of customers, we went public. Uh, you know, you see those pictures of people ringing the bell on, the, on Wall Street. That's what we did uh, at Altiris. Eventually, it was acquired by another company after the IPO. Well, I went back to BYU for business school because I realized that selling software for me was not necessarily what I was going to, what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Um, and so, returning to business school was a great opportunity for me to kind of just explore and test the waters and to learn about a lot of different industries, a lot of different markets, learn from my peers and professors, and, uh, and again, just to do a lot of research. And so I did that, and while I was in business school, uh, I learned about this you know, financial services industry and uh, a lot of the different things that you could do within financial services as an investor, uh, you know, as a, as a trader, as a banker, and ultimately, um, I did a summer internship at a firm called Goldman Sachs, which is in you know, Manhattan. They have a big office in Salt Lake City, but I was in New York at the time. And ultimately, um, signed on full-time at the end of the summer with a firm called Morgan Stanley. And Morgan Stanley was a great experience. And that's kind of where my experience with the Cook family kind of comes into play. We lived on the same island, and our families were friends, and it was a great experience for us. Um, while in New York, um, I realized, again, like I think that each work experience that you have, wherever you start, right, whether it's doing summer, whether you're doing summer sales or whether you're an admin in a company or whether you're a teacher or whether you're working in nonprofits, each life experience that you have is going to provide you with a perspective. And that perspective is going to shape your views on the world and the things that you like and dislike. And I believe that it's really important to kind of discover the things that you enjoy and don't, you know, and that you may not enjoy as much so that you can optimize um, your time and your energy in the areas where you feel like you're going to be uh, best suited for success and interest. Um, and while I was on Wall Street, I learned quite a few things. I learned that this was a fascinating industry and that the world of finance in a lot of respects makes the world go round. But what I learned was that I didn't want to be a lifelong investor and financier necessarily. I wanted to be on the front lines, feeling the wind in my face, kind of building and growing something of value. And so after my Morgan Stanley experience, I jumped into a technology startup called Compliance 11. And that was a software company. Again, I realized that I wanted to be in tech and I, wanted, I had a few you know, areas of criteria that I wanted to pursue. And um, you know, software was a great fit for me, right? I looked, at, uh, I looked at the experiences in, in technology and I thought to myself, I would love to take a company public someday or I would love to build a business that was acquirable at some point. Um, not, just, not just because of the payout and the reward, but because you could see that entire experience from end to end delivering value for those that would work inside of the business. And so that was my decision. Um, and so I joined Compliance 11, and it was a financial services um, technology company, and we were creating what's called a compliance platform so that we could help hedge funds and investment firms monitor all of their employees' trading activities. There were laws that regulated if an if a investment firm was invested in LinkedIn, their employees could not trade in LinkedIn. If the company was invested in General Mills, they could not, the employees could not invest in, uh, in General Mills. Why? Because the firm was deemed to have something called inside information, right? And that was deemed to be an unfair advantage for, for individuals um, inside of the firm if they had insights and information that would help them Ill, you know, illegally trade uh, and favorably trade in their, in their own interest. And so, um, our platform at Compliance 11 helped those firms do many things, but one of the things was to monitor their employees' trading activities, uh, and it could report back to their compliance officers there. It turns out that that was a very popular platform at the time. Have you guys heard of Ber Bernie Madoff? <laughs> do you guys know who that is? He was uh, kind of a, uh, a villain on Wall Street there. Um, anyway, he uh, uh, went to prison and is no longer alive, I believe, but he ended up... Uh, uh, getting arrested because he ran a big operation that, that had a lot of uh, 
a lot of illicit activity that was going on there to give them unfair advantages and he was running a big Ponzi scheme. Anyways, so that platform turned out to be very favorable and Charles Schwab acquired us in 2011 and that's when um, I was introduced to my co-founder uh, at SaltStack, uh, which is eventually where we, you know, the lot where I spent my last nine and a half years. All right. All right. Um, I'm going to talk about the salt stack experience in a moment, but I want to talk a little bit about understanding risk. <sighs> Again, by show of hands, how many of you think that you would love to start something at this point? Quite a few, right? I love it. If you guys have great ideas, I'd love to hear them. Um, I am a big believer that entrepreneurs come in all shapes and sizes, right? And as it turns out, different entrepreneurs have different profile risk profiles as well. Some people are willing to mortgage a second home to fund their business. Some are willing to max out credit cards. Other people would prefer to do it by raising capital. Right? Some people aren't even willing to step into the ring of entrepreneurship and build a business because they would rather have a more stable um, uh, means of earning income for their families, for themselves and their families. I think that it's really important for you through your life experience to understand where you sit on that risk continuum so that you'll appropriately align your decision making to the risks that are associated with it. You've often heard the statement, high risk, high reward, low risk, right? Sort of low, low margin, low return. Um, I, I think that that can apply in the world of entrepreneurship. It doesn't really matter to me and it shouldn't matter to you sort of where you sit on that continuum. We're all different and, and your experiences will shape sort of your view about what's appropriate risk. But my first bit of counsel to you today is to think about where you are in that risk continuum. Are you highly risk loving or are you risk averse? Or are you somewhere in between or somewhere along that spectrum? It's a good question to ask yourself uh, before you jump in and take on that risk, right? Um, my, my next bit of advice is that it's really important for you to know yourself, right? To know and understand uh, your background. And I've got this little rubric here that I've created here. Uh, it, three, circles of <clears throat> three circles that I've got labeled skills, opportunity, and passion. What skills do you bring to the table, right? When you, before you start a business, uh, I find that it's really important for you to think about like what skills you can bring. How can you make the world better and different? How can you improve a market or a product or a solution, right? What skills have you accumulated through life, through business, through your work, through your family situation, through your, your general uh, life experiences overall? What has that been like for you? And as you think about life experience and the skills that you've accumulated, I would document that. I would think about that. You don't have to be super formal and put it all on LinkedIn, but just create a little bit of an information bank for yourself about the skills that you believe that you're accumulating. Line those up with the different areas and goals that you have for yourself and to think about what gap or what delta you have between the skills that you t possess today and that you think you can be excellent at and those things that you feel like you still need to develop. Uh, the next area is the opportunities. And I mentioned that we all start this life with a different set of opportunities. Some are born into great wealth. Some are born into extreme poverty. Um, you know, we live in a very fortunate, very blessed land here where many people have, uh, you know, we live at a high standard relative to the rest of the world. And when you think about uh, where you sit on your set of opportunities, and some people have opportunities for learning and others uh, hopefully many will have and all will have opportunities for learning because I believe that unlocks opportunity as I saw with my grandparents is that they came for education, there was a great period of learning and that opened up big doors for our family. I believe that learning can help us unlock opportunity in our own lives as well. Um, but it's what you do with your opportunities that I think is even more important than what you may know and what knowledge you may possess. Um, I think that that's a principle that has probably um, impressed me most about people that I've hired, the people that I'm drawn to in life, is it doesn't really matter where you come from, but what are you doing with the opportunities that you've been given? I find that uh, I like to hire people who are playing above the rim, so to speak, with the opportunities that they've been given. And so I'll hire somebody maybe that has a less advantaged 
maybe upbringing your starting place if I see great potential and I see them working really hard to develop their opportunities and I think that that's uh, perhaps a principle that, uh, that has been beneficial for me in business. The third area is in passion, right? And I think that um, this is kind of a two-edged sword. I've been, um, there's a book that I've been reading called Personality Isn't Permanent and it talks a lot about how we have fixed and growth mindsets in the world. And one of the principles this book talked about was this notion of a lot of times people will label themselves as introverts, extroverts, you know, we can kind of apply all sorts of labels to ourselves. Um, and as this relates to passion, a lot of people will say, I love this or I don't love this, right? And I think that development of passion comes actually through living life and having and accumulating different life experiences. If you don't live, if you don't try, if you don't learn, how can you really actually truly say that you're passionate about something? I think that experience precedes passion. So, all right. When you're able to combine these three things though in the rubric, I believe that that translates to personal and professional nirvana in some respects. I think that that becomes uh, at least a, a loose framework for all of us as we think about what drives us, what motivates us, what really kind of gets us out of bed in the morning. Um, and so if you can do that, if you can combine skills, opportunity, and passion in your life, I believe that that will be at least a 70-80% formula for you in having joy in your work in the things that you do, whatever that is. All right, so salt stack. Um, salt stack, back in 2011, I was introduced to my co-founder, Tom Hatch, brilliant technologist. He was the, uh, the technical genius and I was sort of the business acumen as we got the business started. Um, he had created something called an open source community, um, which is an environment or uh, it really is a community where people are contributing to using freely the code that you write in software. And this community had just taken off. It was uh, built around the premise of helping IT professionals to automate their, their servers, their data centers, their, uh, their computers and so forth. Exciting stuff, right? Kind of jumps right off the page at you. Um, as it turns out, it's quite, uh, it's, a quite, it's quite a soft, it's a software that's quite in demand. When you think about companies like LinkedIn, a company like LinkedIn or Facebook, right, they've got tens or hundreds of thousands of servers that are you know, used in production, right? Just to genericize those companies, those are not their actual numbers, but you know, they've got many, many tens and hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of servers that need to be managed. And we created the automation that would allow the IT professionals, those that were managing the cloud infrastructure, to do that job in a one-to-many fashion, right? So the automation allowed them to speed up their work, to be a lot more efficient, to save time and money for the companies. And as it turns out, when you're saving companies time or money or you're solving a problem like that for them, they'll give you money to help them solve that problem. And that's how we made, uh, that's how we made our money at SaltStack. We, um, as I mentioned here, I think that it's important to have a vision. Our vision was to intelligently secure and manage every digital enterprise uh, in the world. Big vision. <clears throat> We made good progress at that. This is an early picture of our startup team at a conference down in Southern California. This is kind of that early crew uh, of individuals. This is kind of a fun thing uh, to kind of look back and see how the business scaled and grew from two guys in a basement. The guy uh, uh, in the first black shirt from the right is Tom and then I'm you know, two over from him. But it's essentially, it's an exciting thing to think about creating something from nothing uh, just an idea, and then to be able to build that out. A lot of fun. Um, and a lot of stress along the way, too. Let's see here. And SaltStack grew, right? And this is not the kind of the final count. This is a few years ago, but this is one of the conferences that we attended. But it was awesome, right? It was great to bring a team together, you know, those that have participated on teams. It's a team in the business world, right? You're creating an environment uh, where people are dedicating their time, their talents, their energy, their resources. You know, they're making sacrifices to build up a business. And it's because they believe in the vision and the premise behind what you're doing. And so if you've ever had an idea, right, 
I, that's at the core of leadership there, is like creating an environment there where people can kind of follow and believe in uh, and, and hope for, the, uh, hope for you know, great things down the road in the future. So we built SaltStack up. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna quickly jump ahead here. We were acquired last October by a company called VMware, and that was a lot of fun. All right, so one of the things that I wanted to share with you guys today, uh, three principles maybe as we wrap up in five minutes, and then I'm gonna leave five minutes for questions here. Um, the first is, uh, there was a book, uh, there was an article that my wife read actually called The Psychological Price of Entrepreneurship back in probably 20, when was that written? 14. Okay, so this is two years after we had started. So all the newness of building a startup, all the glamour and glitz of building a company had sort of worn off at this point, and now it's pure work, right? Um, and it was hard, right? Because there were moments there of great struggle in that startup there that we can go into. But um, the, the title, The Psychological Price of Entrepreneurship, I think that for a long time, entrepreneurs have wanted to kind of take this grin and bear it mindset. Entrepreneurs have always kind of been like, oh yeah, things are great, right? Look at my LinkedIn profile or, you know, read this blog post that I'm gonna write and they talk about how great that world is and we often will hear about the high points as opposed to the lows. I think that that's changing largely in our, in our society. But my wife read this article and the quote on the right, it's like a man writing a lion. This is speaking about entrepreneurship and the entrepreneurial journey. It's like a man riding a lion. People think, this guy's brave. And he's thinking, how the H-E double hockey sticks did I get on a lion and how do I keep from being eaten, right? And, and that really was in that moment, I think, how I felt about the entrepreneurial journey. And so, look, entrepreneurship is not always uh, a glamorous journey and it's not for the faint of heart either. Um, and so I just wanted to say that, you know, when you're up there riding the lion, know that I think increasingly that network of people who are able to kind of share experiences and talk about both the good and the bad has increased and improved. Um, and so just go into things with your eyes wide open. We talked about risk continuums as well. The next story I wanted to share with you guys is this story about navigating disappointment. Um, 2015, right? One of the goals that we had as our business was to build it and sell it. And in 2015 or 2014, we were heavily courted by a very, very large business that you would all know. Um, and they made it known to us early on in the process that they had intentions of acquiring our business. Now, you hear about acquisitions all the time, right? You read about the headlines, this company's acquired for a billion dollars, and so we were like, ooh, this is gonna be exciting, right? We went through that entire process, eight months, right? We basically, my wife likes to, we had eight months of work, and then we met with 50 people from their business in a hotel, the Sheraton Hotel, down in Salt Lake City in 2015. And we went through this last phase of what's called due diligence where they were just kind of checking the boxes and kind of going through the process. And we got to the very end of the finish line and then I got a call the day after they completed their due diligence and they said, Mark, I'm sorry to inform you that we're no longer pursuing SaltStack as an acquisition target. You know, whole world was rocked right in that moment there. You can imagine the disappointment. You were thinking, you know, you had like, you know, this thought of your bank account having a few more zeros behind it and, you know, and just like being able to rest and kind of find balance with the family again. And at that moment, we felt like we got stood up at the altar, right? Literally. Such a hard, hard, hard experience there for us to navigate. Um, but the next day, or actually that Monday, I said to my co-founder, Tom, Let's take the weekend, right? And we had worked so hard and we were low on cash. We didn't have a complete business model that was like thriving in the market at that point in time. Our technology was hot, right? And our open source community was like shooting to the moon. Um, but we had real work to do at that point in time. And I remember saying to my co-founder, let's take the weekend and let's come back and let's kind of talk about what we're gonna do. And we collectively, I'm proud to say that we collectively took the weekend off, came back, on Monday and we both sat in our offices and said, are we doing this? And we both kind of like, you know, said we're doing this, right? And we said we're gonna double our efforts down and we're gonna kind of get after it and we're gonna really turn this into something even better. 
And you know, I'm proud to say that from that moment on, you know, things weren't easy, but things uh, did improve, and it no longer felt like we were carrying a big boulder around our necks trying to swim, you know, the English Channel. So it was a it was a hard, hard experience. But through the hardness, I think we refined our vision of what we could become and what we wanted to achieve together. All right, third one. This is kind of a payroll thing. A lot of times entrepreneurs struggle, struggle to make payroll. 2012, I think, 20, as probably 2013. No, actually it was 2014, a little bit further along. We were in a situation where we were in a payroll bind, right? We were 18 hours away. And I looked at the numbers and I said to myself, in 18 hours, we're gonna miss our first payroll. And I don't know how many employees we had at the time, but if you miss payroll, how would you feel if your company came to you and said, I'm so sorry, but we're not gonna be able to pay you tomorrow on payday? How would you feel? Right? Like you've got people relying on you, trust would go way down, right? And, and that creates a, a really difficult environment for um, uh, for employees and for entrepreneurs and for businesses in general. But um, we had such an amazing group of investors and um, I got a call 18 hours before payroll was due. And you know, I don't know how you guys feel about prayer, but like I was praying hard that I would be able to, uh, that there was a way out of this kind of a situation. And that afternoon before I left the office, I got a call uh, from one of my earliest investors, a gentleman by the name of Rod Haas. Um, and Rod calls me up and he says, Mark, I was just thinking about you this morning and I was wondering if there was something that I could do for you. Now, Rod was very successful in his own right, in his own career. He was a seed and angel investor for us. And he was someone that I feel, you know, was sort of attuned to whatever uh, he was feeling in that moment. But he called us, invited us to, uh, invited to help. Uh, and of course, we made payroll the next day, um, thankfully, and we moved on and, and things got much better from that, from that time forward. But a lot of times, you know, you'll go through those experiences. And I think that, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that in life, uh, and in your personal journey, that there are people around you, right, who care about you, who want to see you succeed, uh, who are rooting for you, who are cheering for your success. Uh, and, you know, I think that this speaks to the importance of working with great people, finding and surrounding yourself, finding great people and surrounding yourself with great people who you like, trust, and want to do business with uh, throughout your entire career. Life is too short not to. I'm a big believer that when you can do that, you'll achieve more um, with them than if you were to do it alone. So that was a great experience for us in terms of discovering that there were people out there that had a vested interest in our success. Very grateful for him. I went home that night emotional and told my kids, don't ever forget this name, right? This name is gonna be you know, etched in stone in our family forever. So uh, he, he is, and he's been great. All right, um, look, I, I want to just conclude before we do Q&A by saying that uh, I'm really grateful for the entrepreneur's journey. I'm grateful for the journey that I've been on. I think that um, you know, we're all innate builders and creators in life. I think that there's, whether you're highly creative or a little bit creative, I think that there is a desire in each and every one of us to create and to build something of value, whether that's a family, a business, you know, uh, there's just that, that's inborn, I think, in all human beings. And so as I think about your journey, I wish you great success as you think about the learning, the experiences, and the opportunities that you're gonna, that you are yet to encounter in life that will help to shape your professional journeys and your journey through life. And I wish you guys all the great, uh, all the best success as you go about that. Thank you.